Well, welcome everyone. We're so glad that you're here. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Welcome everyone online in our gatherings, our prison campuses. We're one family, so many different locations. But we've all come together today for one reason and one reason alone. And that's to lift the name of Jesus high. How many know that this is the day the Lord has made? We get to rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know what you brought in here, but the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is here. So come on, let's position our hearts and posture our lives to lift Jesus high. Where the Son of Man is lifted high, he will draw all people to himself. So we're gonna lift him high. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that we get to be in your presence. Lord, thank you that you've given your life so we can have real life and we wanna bring our best to you today. So we lift your name, Jesus, because you're valuable and you're worth it. We give you our highest praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together.
So good. And listen, we have the unique privilege to join together today and participate in the Lord's Supper communion. What an honor. What an honor. Invited by Jesus to do this in remembrance of what he did for us. If you need the elements, we have people that can bring them to you. Just raise your hand. Someone will serve you gladly. I don't want to do a ritual today. I don't wanna just go through the motions today and do the thing that we have grown accustomed to doing, but I wanna do what Jesus said today. I want us to call to the forefront of our memory what's actually been done for us. It's an interesting season that we're in, and you know, Monday night actually begins Passover on the Jewish calendar, and we honor, we have so many Jewish members here at Gateway, and we honor you, and we celebrate Passover with you. What an honor it is to have you as a part of this family. But during this Passover season, I'm reminded that it was Passover Seder, Passover dinner that Jesus so longed for and anticipated to sit down with his friends. You know, in the word it says that he was eager to have this meal with them before he would suffer. So he knew he was gonna suffer and he knew this would be his last time with his friends and he had an announcement to make. And if you know the elements that were taken during the Passover dinner, it's all commemorative of the lamb that was slain and the blood that was placed over the door of the slaves, the, uh, the Israelite slaves when they were in bondage in Egypt. And God had sent 10 plagues and this plague was the one that was gonna loosen the grip of the Egyptian slave masters and set the people free from oppression. A lamb had to be sacrificed and the blood of that lamb was painted over the door and the death angel would visit all of Egypt and all of Israel and Egypt, but the ones that believed in the word of God and put the blood of that lamb on the doorpost, the angel of death would pass over. And it happened and it set the people free. Death came to every single home, but for the ones who believed it was the death of a lamb, it was a substitution. And Jesus is sitting at the table with his friends and they're going through this and talking about it and celebrating it just like they did every single year. And he takes the unleavened bread, the, the bread that was cooked and was thin and had holes in it and stripes on it. And he said, look, this is my body. And every time you do this, I want you to remember that I'll be pierced for you. I'll be, I'll be bruised for you. I'll be striped for you. I'll be broken for you, broken for your wholeness. There's an exchange that takes place. I'll be broken so you don't have to be. And he takes the fourth cup, the cup of the red wine, which would resemble the blood of the lamb that was painted on the doors. And he said, I'm gonna present to you a new covenant. Just a matter of hours. I'll spill my blood for you and it will satisfy the wrath of God once and for all, for all who would believe and paint that blood over the doorposts of their life. He was eager to tell that news because it was coming. He was gonna solve our greatest problem once and for all. And he said, every time you gather together and take these elements, remember, remember that your brokenness, this problem of brokenness has been solved because I was broken so you can be whole. And remember that I've poured out my life source for your emptiness. Where are you empty? I've poured my life source out. And most of all, I've solved your greatest problem. You can now stand before the Father righteous and I'll take on your sin and pay your debt, which you could never pay. Remember, oh, come on, so where are you broken? What brokenness have you brought in here? We all have it. Where are you empty? Where are you empty of life? 
today? Where are you empty and what do you need? Because there's a great exchange that takes place here at this table. Jesus offers wholeness for your brokenness. He offers life for your emptiness and he offers eternal life for those who will come underneath the blood that was shed in the new covenant. So let's take it today with eagerness in our heart. He's coming back. Let's take it today with remembrance in our heart that he solved our problem. And let's take it today with exchange on our heart and bring our brokenness and our emptiness to him and let him fill us once again. Take that bread and look at it. Jesus, thank you that you were broken so we don't have to be. Let's take the bread. Receive that gift today of wholeness and take the cup. Where are you empty today? Receive Jesus, receive his, his payment, receive his substitution death for your sin. You're made righteous because of this blood. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Let's receive it. We thank you, Jesus, and because you have made a way, you are the way, we can rightly stand before the Father in intimacy, in friendship, and we will spend eternity with you because of your great sacrifice. We remember today, in Jesus' name, let's worship.
Jesus Christ. Come on, we sing it out. You are. Because you are so worthy. Yes, you are. like we join in with heaven when we just scream hallelujah and glory to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That feels right, doesn't it? There's a lot of things that feel wrong out there, but that feels right. I hope that resonates deep, deep, deep in your soul tonight. Jesus wants an intimate relationship with you. His presence is unbelievable. That's where there's real joy and freedom and I'm so glad that we get to worship together. This is a very special week at Gateway. It's our Men's Summit Week where this room will be full of men in just a few days. If you've never experienced a house full of men screaming at, their to at the top of their lungs, worship is really powerful. It feels like a battle cry and it really is. It's gonna happen and it's gonna happen in just a few days and I'm very excited about it and I'm sure that the enemy's not. But one thing I love about Gateway Church is that the men of Gateway Church show up, worship, lift their hands, dance before the Lord, bow before the Lord, set the examples for our sons and our daughters and our wives by being the head of our family, by leading our homes and leading our families to church. I honor you men today. 
And you may think, you know, I don't even know what I'm doing, but you're here or you're watching. And that's, be that's better than some people and great. It's a great thing because when you make a step of faith into the house of God, into the presence of God, he meets you and he fills in all the gaps. And so can we do something special today as we lead up to this men's summit? Men of God and men in the room who want to be men of God and men online who are seeking God and love the Lord. Can we just, can we just put all of our faith together and all of our prayer together and pray for the men who call Gateway Church home, the men who are watching today. Can we pray for the men in the prisons that are gonna be great fathers and great leaders and they're, and they're, gonna, and they're gonna get out and they're gonna lead their families. Can we pray for the men in this room and all the rooms of Gateway Church as we stand on the truth that is Jesus and we lead our families against culture? Come on, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the warrior men of Gateway Church, sons of the living God. That's our identity. We are sons of God. We have a heart like our Father God. Help us to be more like you. Fill us with your spirit. Break our hearts for what break yours. We wanna lead our families and we wanna lead society and we wanna lead in this kingdom because we want your kingdom come and your will be done. Fill your sons, the men of God of Gateway Church, to do great things for the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad that you guys are here. You picked a great time to be in church. Let's turn around and say hello to a few people. Well, Welcome to church. It's good to see you. Welcome to Gateway Church. does he think he is? You know, he cannot and will not change. I mean, we would be how many better second off chances should be too too embarrassing too really if you just give up? Done. Why are we even still talking about this? He is no longer capable of leading his family. End of discussion. Enough. We're so glad you're here. If it's your first time joining us, we'd love to connect with you. Meet us at Connect Central after service or text CONNECT to 71010. We're all about people because God's all about people. We have so many ways for you to get connected to ministry and each other. God designed us to be in community. No matter what stage of life you're in, there's something for you. Check out what's coming up soon. like to give today, you can give on our website, the mobile app, or an envelope at any Gateway campus. Remember to follow us on social media or join your campus Facebook group to stay up to date on all that's going on. Thank you for joining us. a place for you. You may go years and not understand your place. You may go years and never understand your plan. But don't you worry, God created you for a purpose and your day will come. 
I want you and I want every Christian to be successful. And I believe if you love God and do as well, you're successful. I have figured out that the world would be a much better place if people would just do what Jesus says. Hello, welcome everyone. I do want to encourage you, Men Summit is this week and it is going to be powerful. Now, we are sold out, but you can still join online. And so if you still wanna join, then get online, see how to do that. You may wanna just watch by yourself or you may wanna join, get a bunch of guys together and watch Men Summit. It is going to be Amazing, the content, everything that comes out of it, the Spirit of God that's gonna be there, it's going to be great. Also, I wanna let you know that early voting starts this Monday, and so my grandpa is here, and years ago, he was running for a local election in East Texas, and I know I could not vote for him because he was not in my area, but I still told everyone I knew because I was excited because he's family. And because he's family, I wanted all my friends to be praying for him. And so in a similar way, we have a group of churches in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and we have several people that are running that are members of Gateway or members of one of our related churches. And so these people are running, and they are family. And so what I'm asking is that we all look at these names and we pray for these people because I can't imagine the spiritual pressure that they will be feeling in this season. And so I just wanna ask all of us to be praying for them, but really and truly, we need to be praying for every candidate. We need to be praying for every person in office because God tells us to pray for them, so that's a good reason. Uh, but as far as Gateway Church, Gateway Church does not support or endorse any candidate, but I do want to remind us to be praying for all those that are running. And so that is right around the corner, early voting this Monday. So I started off with a, just mentioning my grandpa. I have another grandpa story. But first, I wanna just say I have really, really enjoyed sharing a series with my dad. And so the title of the series is that Jesus is in the center, and then each week it's been your, dot, dot, dot. So it was first your stress, then your prayer. This week is your brokenness. Jesus is in the center of your brokenness. And when Bridget and I, we first got married, I didn't have a house, but I had a small fishing cabin. I had my priorities right. So I had a, a small fishing cabin in East Texas, and I would go often. And so I would go to this fishing cabin while Bridget and I got married, and it was time to not leave it as just a man cave. And so we started doing a lot of DIY to it, to fix it up, to make it a little bit nicer. And so we were fixing it up. My grandpa also had a fishing cabin right next to mine. And so we would see each other a lot. And so there was this one particular time that we were out there and we were gonna do a little renovation and remodel the bathroom. Now it's only a 500 square foot cabin. It's one room. When I say one room, not one bedroom, just one room. The whole thing is just one room and one bathroom. And so we were fixing the bathroom up, and so we were changing the toilet. Sounds like an easy enough task, right? So here we were fixing the toilet, and then we had to do something on the main water line. And so I was working on it the best I possibly could until then my grandpa said, let me try. So then he tried, which then I heard a large snap. And then it followed by something he said, and he said, oh, now that needed to be broken. <laughs> I thought it was perfectly fine as it was. What do you mean that needed to be broken? He said, oh yeah, no, that, so you see, that needed to be broken. And what he meant is that there was something wrong in the way it was built, and so therefore it needed to be broken because then that gives us the opportunity to build it right. There was something wrong with the integrity of how it currently was and so that needed to be broken so that it could then be repaired the way that it should be. Now, honestly, I didn't think it needed to be broken all that much. And initially, it didn't feel good that it was broken, and I thought this is gonna cost more money, this would be more time, more energy, more effort. I thought of all the bad reasons why I didn't think 
that this was a great idea that this pipe just broke. But he said, this is, this is great. Now, since then, uh, my grandpa, he lives with us. We do a lot of projects together. I love doing projects with him. And I have heard him say this, term, this phrase many times. We were actually doing something on the same fishing cabin and fixing the floors when one of the main piers gave out and the floor collapsed. And guess what? For some reason, that needed to be broken. It's amazing. And since then, I've now adopted this phrase, and now Bridget has heard me many times say, oh yeah, now that needed to be broken. And sometimes we would rather not to be broken. And so the first point of today's message is our brokenness. Our brokenness. And we will be looking at how our brokenness, and so in that, there are things about ourselves, things in us that need to be broken. Not all brokenness is a bad thing. Sometimes whenever we experience something that's broken, we immediately think the same way I did. This is gonna be more time, more energy, this is bad, how in the world, like, come on. But not everything that breaks in our life is actually a bad thing, and there could be a chance that God's actually using it to break something in us. Potentially, our will needs to be broken, our pride needs to be broken, our strongholds need to be broken, and so God can actually use brokenness in order to work something out of us. I wonder if at times something breaks in us of our pride or something and Jesus says, oh yeah, now that needed to be broken. Now, in the American Christian society, most times when we experience something broken, we blame the devil. Anything that breaks, it must be the devil's fault. I got a flat tire, devil did it. I just had something bad just happened. I forgot my lunch today, devil did it. Devil didn't distracted me. Yeah, the enemy did it. Obviously, there's no way that would have happened because I'm very, very smart, and then the enemy would have done that. So anything bad that happens, we assume it's the enemy. But is there a chance that some of it's actually God, and Jesus is right there in the center, and he's trying to teach us something out of that? So that's what we will be looking at today. And if we can realize that Jesus is in the center, he's in the center of our circumstance, he's in the center of our brokenness, then we could see that maybe we should look at this in a different perspective. Maybe we should be saying, Lord, is there something you're trying to teach me right now in this brokenness? Is there something going on right now that I need to know through this? When Jesus was flipping tables in the temple, things broke. But guess what? That's because things needed to break. It's like my grandpa said, that needed to be broken. So that it could get better and so therefore, God can sometimes break things in our lives so that we can get better. So that's what we'll be looking at. And in doing so, we are going to be looking at Hebrews 12, starting in verse five. Now this is what God says is encouraging. Meaning, this is God's way of putting courage in us. So wait until you see. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children, he said. So this is God encouraging us. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one as he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years doing the best they knew how. Some of us wish that they knew how to even better. But luckily, God does. It says, but, God disciplined in God, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But, af but afterward, there, are, there will be a peaceful harvest, right living for those who are trained in this way. Sometimes we can go through difficult times. Sometimes it feels like, God, why are you doing this to me? This isn't fair, why? You know I love you, so why would you do this? 
And he's telling us it could actually be a form of love so that you can experience a better lifestyle and a better life in the end. And so sometimes he's actually working things out of us because it needed to be broken so that he can make you all that he's called you to be. Otherwise, you may be limiting yourself of who you are called to be. Now, all throughout scripture, Jesus and God the Father are referred to as the rock, the cornerstone, the stone. And so we're gonna look at a scripture about that. And um, even David in the Old Testament said that, uh, Lord, you are my rock and my shelter. But then Matthew 21, starting in verse 42, it says, the stone which the, Lord, which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Then it says in 44, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. We can either fall on the rock, which is Jesus, and be broken. But when we do that, it actually allows him to heal us in such a way. I think my parents knew this scripture well because I remember there was this time that I had done something I should not have. Surprise, there was more than one time, but there was one specific time that stands out to me that I had done something that I should not have done. And I don't know if they used this as a tactic to get all of it out of me, of what all I did, or if they actually knew what I did. But I remember my parents saying, okay, James, we know what you did was wrong. And if you just tell us the truth, the consequences will be less than if you lie to us. It was kind of like, listen, if you will just fall on the rock, the consequ- then you'll just be broken. But you don't want to be crushed. And so it was this way of saying, I know what you did is wrong. But now do the right thing and tell the truth. And so there are times that this happens that we can actually have a choice to, are we going to go and humble ourselves? and fall on the rock and say, Jesus, help me. I know I'm flawed, I know I messed up, but Lord, I am flawed and I need your help. Please help me. And we have that opportunity. Now, just in case some of you are like, just doesn't apply to me. I've got another scripture for you. First John 1, verse eight. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So all of us, including myself quite often, still mess up. And it's like my grandpa said, that needed to be broken. I need to be broken. I need to go to the Lord and repent for what I've done because it is not what he has for me in the end. I I have to start working those things out of me. So I have another question. How do you handle your brokenness? And in doing so, we can look at David. Now, David went through a lot of broken times, a lot of broken moments, but there's this one particular time we're gonna look at. His son Absalom tries to take over the kingdom in a not so good way and he is feeling very broken. He is now walking through a valley with him and all of his mighty men army that is with him. This would be like the President of the United States walking through a valley surrounded by a bunch of Marines, and you're like, you don't want to mess with those people. But there was this one crazy nut named Shimei that was there. Shimei was walking along the side of them, cursing King David, throwing rocks at him, kicking up dust at him, and yelling at him. I just don't think that's a wise thing to do. So let's see how David responded, though. So it's talking about Shimei. Shimei, he threw stones, uh, verse 6. He threw stones at the king and the king's officers and all the mighty warriors who surrounded him. Then in verse 9, it's uh, one of David's mighty men says, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Then he goes on to say, let me go over and cut off his head. Problem solved. I can, that's a whole new way of saying put a sock in it. Like, I can make him be quiet. I know how. David, just let me go put him, you know, that's it. And David had the full ability legally and everything to say, y'all fit this head. But this is how David responded. Leave him alone and let him curse for the Lord has told him to do it. I don't know if we always think that way. 
And perhaps the Lord will see that I am being wronged and will bless me because of these curses today. So David and his men continued down the road and Shimei kept, kept pace with them on a nearby hillside, cursing and throwing stones and dirt at David. Another translation, uh, David says, perhaps the Lord has sent him to humble me. Let's put that in today's terms. So let's say we leave church today. We hop, we're hopping on the highway, and all of a sudden, somebody cuts you off. Then they start honking their horn, and then they're throwing inappropriate sign language at you. <laughs> Do we have the tendency to say, well, praise the Lord. Maybe he sent him here for me just to work out this pride that I've been struggling with lately. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you for the blessings. That's not normally how we respond. Instead, we're like, oh, no, you didn't. I'll show you. So every time that we're wronged, is it actually that God may be using that circumstance? And now, I do want to clarify, sometimes God may be using that circumstance, and then sometimes it is the enemy, and then sometimes it's just because we live in a fallen world. But let's say this is happening, and all of a sudden, what is our tendency? Oh, no, you didn't. I'll show you, I'll do this. Or, Satan, you're evil, you're bad, it's always devil's fault. But maybe God's actually using that circumstance to work something out of us. Maybe that pride that rises up, it's something like, oh, that needed to be broken. Maybe whenever we get so wronged, we can look at it knowing that Jesus is in the center and say, Lord, what are you doing in this, in this circumstance? What are you trying to get me to get out of this? And the reason why he's doing it is so that he can work things out of us so that we can be more Christ-like. And so this is what's happening. And so here's David like, well, blessing. Perhaps the Lord will bless me because I responded well. Look at that. And so this is an opportunity that we have. So point number one was our broken, no, yeah, our brokenness. This point number two is Jesus restores our brokenness. Jesus restores our brokenness. Now, when I was a kid, I remember this story quite well. So my dad worked with somebody, and it's just somebody with kind of a, he's a big guy, big personality. He only has one like voice, and it is not a library quiet voice. It is only loud coach voice. And so he's just kind of, whenever he's in the room, his presence is made known, no matter where he is. And so he's just kind of a, a big guy. And now this is also a time that like early 90s probably that no iPhones, technology wasn't all that it is now. And so this guy was over at his desk and all of a sudden my dad is down the hall and he can hear him saying, oh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what, ha what happened now? What, what happened? And all of a sudden, he comes running over to my dad's office and says, I done did it now. I did it. It, it blew up. It just blew up. And he said, my dad said, what are you talking about? He says, my computer. I didn't do anything. It just blew up. I didn't touch it. I promise it's not my fault. I didn't do anything all by itself. It just blew up. <laughs> he said, thousands of little pieces all over. So my dad was like, I have to go see this, like this computer that blew up. So my dad walks over there, and guess what? Some of you might know, the little screensaver with the fireworks. <laughs> I told you, I told you it blew up. I didn't touch it, I didn't do anything. It just blew up all on its own. So my dad's like, okay. He goes over, he touches the mouse, and it comes back on. What, what'd you do? How'd you do that? I share that story to tell you that sometimes our brokenness isn't as bad as we think it is. <laughs> we oftentimes make our brokenness as it, the most extreme, doom and gloom, worst thing that could possibly ever happen. I can't believe it. Look how bad it is. And sometimes God just says, I got it. Why are you stressing out so much? Why are you worried so much? You know I'm with you. Here it is. It's just the computer fell asleep. That's all it is. It could be something that small that sometimes we get so worked up. Now, with this, uh, I want to, to share the, the heart and the posture 
because Jesus restores our brokenness, that we are to go to the Lord. So in Psalm 51, verse 17, it says, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. God will not reject you when you come to him with a broken heart. When you need him, when you're, not, when you're feeling broken, run to Jesus. He's the only one that can be there to help. Otherwise, we run to all the, things, all the things in the world, all of the little coping methods, all of these things, they can't help you. We need Jesus. And guess what? It's like currency to Jesus. He loves it when we come with a repentant, broken heart and says, come on in, son. Come on in, daughter. I've got you. This is it. We, I've got you. So not last week, the week before I, I spoke and I talked about Peter and I shared how Peter was given a task and that was to stay up and pray. Peter did not do it. Instead, he fell asleep and on, when Jesus told him to pray three times. Then Jesus, Jesus tells him, you're going to do it, but then he did do it. And Peter ended up denying Jesus three times. So now I'm going to pick up on that story. And so this is Jesus now talking to Peter. Jesus then died, was resurrected on the third day. And then he goes and he catches a bunch of fish, 153 fish, and he feeds everyone. And then he pulls Peter aside and has this conversation with him. In John 21, starting in verse 15, it says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So in looking at this full picture, Jesus, Peter had failed Jesus. He fell asleep on him three times. He denied him three times. And now Jesus is asking him, do you love me three times? I think that this was such a broken moment for Peter. Here he is. He knows he has failed Jesus. And he's sitting in front of Jesus, his resurrected Savior, his resurrected Lord. And he's sitting there. And Jesus is asking him, do you love me? Do you love me? And he asked him three times, and each time he says to feed my sheep, to tend my flock. And so what I think happened is Peter's at his lowest low. And all of a sudden, Jesus is using that time to remind him, hey, I know you still love me. I know you denied me three times, therefore I'm going to ask you three times, do you love me? And he used that time to actually then build him up because he knew that he was called to something so much greater. He was called to be this great disciple, this great person, this great man of God. But at this point, he was at his lowest low. And Jesus is then building him up and reminding him, hey, I recognize what you did. And I still love you, but and do you still love me? And reminding him of that because Peter had this great calling, this great purpose on his life. And he didn't want his brokenness to hold him back. But it's almost like when breaking a bone, that then you get a splint, that you have to get your splint to be Jesus to, so that it grows in the right direction. Well, in the same way, he then says, Peter, come with me. I'm, I'm with you. I got you. I know that you love me. Because he had this great calling and this great purpose in his life. Now, I wonder how many of us have this great calling, this great purpose in our life, but we might be wallowing in our brokenness so much that we're not even hearing Jesus correcting us like the loving father saying, do you love me? And yet building him up in his brokenness to say, I know you're still here. I, everything's okay. Because guess what? Not long after this, 
Peter then preaches at Pentecost and 3,000 people got saved. So here Jesus is actually building him up, getting him prepared for the 3,000 people that need this message and saying, do you love me? Do you love me? God can use our brokenness to restore us, to build us up so that we will be ready for the full calling and purpose that he has for us. So this is what God does for us. So point number three is his brokenness. His brokenness. I know here at the South Lake campus, Pastor Ben mentioned this during communion, but how Jesus' body was broken for us. In, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24, it says uh, it's talking about communion. It's also called the Lord's Supper. And so here he is, he's talking about it, and this is what Jesus says. Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, I do want to give one point of clarification. None of Jesus' bones were broken, but his body was broken. Because none of his bones were broken because it actually fulfilled Old Testament prophecy that not one bone would be broken. And so that happens three times in Old Testament prophecy that not one of his bones would be broken. And so even those three people hanging on the cross, Jesus is one of them. The soldiers go to break the legs of all of them and they break the legs of the other two, but when they came to Jesus, they noticed that he was already dead, so instead they stabbed him with a spear, which also fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. And so Jesus, none of his bones were broken, which fulfilled the prophecy, but he was broken. His body was broken. And when Jesus cries out, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? relationship, community, communion with him and God the Father was broken. It was broken though so that that relationship between you and God will never have to be broken. But he was broken so that we don't have to live in a broken state anymore. He was broken, his body was broken in that relationship that, was, that broke during the fall was completely healed in that time so now we can have a perfect relationship through Jesus Christ with God. That's amazing. Now, this is an amazing thing that happens that Jesus Christ actually humbled himself to the point of death. And, and Philippians says this, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. This is the God that we get to serve. And this is the same God that understands your brokenness in a whole way that he understands. He's there with us. And he wants to build us up through our brokenness so that we can reach our full calling and purpose through him. Now, when I was in youth group uh, here at Gateway, this is many years ago, and so I was in youth group, and I had heard the Bible many times. Obviously, my dad's a pastor. And so I knew the Bible. I knew many scriptures. I could, in uh, elementary, we played that little sword game where you have to say a thing and hurry up and find it. I could do that. So I knew all of the stuff, and yet I was still one of the most stubborn people you would come across. Strong-willed stubborn. So I was very, very stubborn and very strong-willed, and I was still living fully, fully from myself. And I, my relationship with my parents just wasn't that great. My relationship with my siblings wasn't that great. So I go off to this youth camp, and I remember in that time so clearly God saying, yes, but now will you make me Lord of your life? And it was that time where I truly went and fell on the rock and was broken so that he could restore me. And now it's not that that day I was perfect after that, surprising, but guess what? There's been this ongoing breaking to, in order to make me more and more Christ-like. And so this has happened. So then I come back from camp, saved, and I am way different with my parents, with everyone. And so it was after a couple of weeks, my dad said, hey, I mean, we all love it, but what's, what's going on? What, what happened to you? I said, oh, I got saved. And he was like, you weren't going to tell us? I said, I thought you would notice. 
you know. And the thing is, because I had fallen on the rock, I'm a different person. I allowed the falling on the rock to break me and to break my will and to break my pride so that he could then build me up so that I can continue to be more and more Christ-like. It's like my grandpa said, that needed to be broken. My question for us today is what is in us that needs to be broken? What is it in us that is holding us back from reaching all of our potential and all of our, that God has for us, all of our calling, that we're just hanging on to and we say that does not need to be broken. But God's saying, I'm trying to break it, not to hurt you, because I love you, so that you can be more Christ-like, so that you can walk with me in a greater way. That's what he does for us. So that I just want to take a moment and pray with all of us. So if you could just bow your heads and close your eyes. And we do this every single week and we ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Lord, is there any brokenness that you need to heal in our lives? God, is there anything that you still want broken so that you can heal it in such a way to make us better, stronger, Lord, is there something in our integrity that you need to shape, you need to strengthen? God, how do we handle our brokenness now? Do we run to you, humble ourselves? Lord, I pray for every single heart and mind that you would build them up, that you would restore them wholeheartedly in everything they're doing. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.